With just four weeks until Election Day, one Republican senator is drawing fierce condemnation for racist rhetoric. And President Biden is gearing up for a trip out west, making his pitch to voters and donors in the final campaign stretch. For analysis of it all, I'm joined as we are each Monday by Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. Hello to both of you, and in case you have not checked the calendar, tomorrow, <laughs> after tomorrow, four weeks until Election Day, it's November the 8th, just reminding. Yeah, I, I uh, wasn't paying attention at all, Judy. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. I know you weren't. <laughs> but because of that, we want to mark this occasion by asking each one of you, where does this race stand? I mean, the Republicans have been very confident, Amy, they're going to pick up the House, the Senate in the balance. What does it look like? Yeah, this looks like, in some ways, a typical midterm election. You have a president where that president's party has the House and the Senate. It's very hard to keep those traditionally. The president not particularly popular. That usually draws the party down, drags that party down, and the party does lose seats in the House and the Senate, probably loses the Senate and the House. Except what we're noticing this year is that it's not just all about Joe Biden and Democrats. It's also about the former president, Donald Trump, and it's about, of course, the historic decision this June made by the Supreme Court to overturn the Roe versus Wade decision. And so what the way I uh, talk about this is it's as if the winds are still blowing at Republicans' backs. It's not that the winds suddenly change directions, right? We didn't go from an election that was uh, bad for Democrats to one that's gr great for Democrats. But it's not, the wind is not quite as strong at uh, the backs of Republicans or in the face of Democrats, thanks in part, as I said, to the fact that we're talking a lot about issues like abortion, Donald Trump, that motivate the Democratic base, and the fact that Republicans nominated a number of candidates, especially at the Senate level, who are very flawed. And finally, structurally, Democrats, again, in the Senate, but also in the House, there aren't that many um, very difficult, vulnerable seats. That has also helped Democrats. And so I still give Republicans the advantage, but it's just not as significant as it was, say, earlier in the year or even before the summer. What would you add to that? I would just say that, um, and I think I've said this before on Politics Monday, but that if you go back a few months before the Dobbs decision on abortion, all of the signals were pointing in one direction, and those signals were all pointing to it being a pretty difficult year for Democrats. Since then, the, there are a lot of really mixed signals uh, where Democrats are, are having pretty good fundraising, uh, where uh, Republicans are, are facing these challenges with candidates, for instance. Um, and and a, a Republican I talked to who is working to get Republicans elected in the House, a top-level person, said that the Dobbs decision absolutely has made a difference, in particular because in swing districts, voters tend to be pro-choice. Um, uh, however, uh, he, he also added that they also still really care and rank as high on their list of issues, um, uh, the economy and crime, and you see Republicans hammering the message of crime. No, no question. I just came back from Wisconsin where you see that all over the airwaves. That piece is going to air in a few days. But it, it, you brought up, um, uh, whatever you brought up, it makes, me, <laughs> it makes me want to ask you, Tam, because you cover the White House, about the fact that President Biden is now hitting the campaign trail. He's making a swing this week out west. What's behind that? Yeah, and I will say that uh, we were expecting the president's travel schedule to really kick into gear earlier this year, but then he had COVID and and things got delayed, and then he had uh, you know like rebound COVID, and and so the the travel has been slow to get going, but that's not the only thing affecting that's his right. travel <clears throat> schedule. Uh, also, there aren't a lot of places where he can go and stand side by side with one of the Democratic candidates and actually help. And what we've seen a lot of and what we're going to see with this coming West Coast swing is that he's doing a lot of closed door fundraisers where there aren't cameras in the room, where he is able to meet with Democratic donors, raise a lot of money. And as I said before, Democratic fundraising is doing pretty darn well. So he has a fundraiser with Nancy Pelosi in Los Angeles that we know about uh, later this week uh, with the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. What we don't know is whether he will be 
appearing with uh, candidates in California who are uh, in difficult races, whether he will be appearing with a candidate in Oregon who's having a difficult race. And also, right. he's going to Colorado, where that Senate race is a lot closer than people were expecting. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the other interesting things and unique things about this midterm election is so many of these Democrats that uh, Tam mentioned, part of the reason that they're still in competitive races, that they're not falling behind or they haven't fallen behind Republicans is that they're polling so much better than the president in these districts and these states. Normally, what you see is a, a president with approval ratings as low as this president really does drag. It's like a, it is like an anchor pulling down uh, the, the candidates of that president's party. In this case, they've been able to rise above it. Now, Republicans still believe that if they can, they have a, still a month more to go mm -hmm. to try to link Democratic candidates with the president to try to pull them closer together. But it's reason why these Democratic candidates don't want to give the president <laughs> time in their state on a debate, I mean, on a uh, rally stage where they're actually able to make that direct link. Like, see, this person is a Biden Democrat. Well, the other person who's been out on the trail uh, a fair amount is the former president, That's right. Donald Trump, uh, Tam. He was in Nevada this weekend, and so was the senator from Alabama, the Republican senator, Tommy Tuberville, who has been criticized before now for escalating rhetoric on crime, tying it to race. Here's what he said this weekend. Some people say, well, they're soft on crime. No, they're not soft on crime. They're pro-crime. They want crime. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparation because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. So he's talking about Democrats and clearly referring to black Americans. Indeed. Uh, and there's really no getting around the fact that that uh, is a, a racist statement, the idea that only black people commit crime or something, which is just patently untrue. Uh, and... Um, yeah, just very much untrue. But uh, what I will say is that the, the um, Republican effort to tie Democrats to crime, to say that Democrats want crime or are, um, you know, like soft on crime, uh, are want lenience on criminals, that is very much on message with the Republican campaigns. Uh, there is a huge amount of spending on crime-related advertising. You mentioned Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, Priorities USA is a Democratic group, but they're tracking uh, ad spending, uh, digital ad spending from both parties. What they told me this week is that 70% of the digital ads, these are targeted ads being run in that Wisconsin Senate race, are about crime on the Republican side, only 15% about the economy. So if you want to know where they think they're winning messages, look where they're spending their money. And where they think they can. But a statement like this, Amy, does it make a difference in, in, in how people vote? So this is at a rally with folks who are firm, true believers of Donald Trump. I also think, Judy, we're living in a time where the consequences for what would have been considered outrageous behavior don't come to pass. That we have candidates saying and doing things that, again, in, in previous years, either voters would have kicked them out or the party leadership would have said, that's not okay, we don't do that. There's no reason for folks to not do that because actually the incentive structure now rewards people who are the most outrageous, say the most outrageous things. And also, I think it goes back to 2016. So many politicians now look at Donald Trump and say, he won after the Access Hollywood tape. Yeah. If he can do that, so can I, so can that person. It's up to voters to say, actually, you know what? I know I'm tied to my party. I know maybe I don't like the other party very much, but I can make a difference here by saying I'm not going to stick with my party and I'm going to go and choose the other side. Well, I think it's important for us to point to these statements when they take place. It That's reminds right. us what kind of discussion are happening out there. Amy Walter, Tamara Keith, thank you both. You're welcome. Very welcome.